The three major classes of steroid hormones are the glucocorticoids, the mineralocorticoids, and the sex hormones. So the major glucocorticoid is cortisol, the major mineralocorticoid is aldosterone, and the sex hormones are the androgens, the estrogens, and the progestins. Now, all three classes of steroid hormones can be produced in the outer portion of the adrenal gland we call the adrenal cortex. In addition, we can also synthesize certain sex hormones outside the adrenal glands in peripheral tissues such as the gonads. So in males, the gonads are the testes, and in females, the gonads are the ovaries. In addition, during embryological development in pregnant women, we can also actually synthesize specific types of sex hormones in the placenta. Now, all steroid hormones are hydrophobic. They don't dissolve very well in water. And that's a problem because our blood is predominantly water. And so what that means is once we synthesize the steroid hormones to actually move them in the bloodstream to the target location, we have to carry them on proteins. So as we know, albumin is the major protein in the blood and it can do many things. And it actually acts as a non-specific carrier for steroid hormones. For example, it can bind to aldosterone and move it to its target location. In addition, we also have more specific carrier proteins. We have corticosteroid binding globulin, also known as transcortin, which binds, uh, uh, which binds cortisol and moves it to its target location. And then we have sex hormone binding protein, and that can bind and transport sex hormones. So let's suppose we synthesize a steroid hormone, it's picked up by one of these carrier molecules, then what happens? Well, the carrier protein brings it to its target cell, whatever that cell may be, and then it releases it. And because the steroid hormone is hydrophobic, it can simply diffuse across the mostly hydrophobic cell membrane. And once inside the cell, that steroid hormone binds to receptors either in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus. Either way, once bound to the receptor, it causes dimerization and it causes the complex to accumulate within the nucleus of the cell. Now, the binding of the hormone to that receptor also exposes a DNA binding domain on that receptor that allows it to interact via a zinc finger motif with the DNA. Specifically, the dimerized complex interacts and binds onto the regulatory DNA sequence known as hormone response element, so HRE. Once bound onto the hormonal response element, it increases transcription of target genes and ultimately that builds new proteins and the new proteins elicit that specific physiological response, whatever it may be. So we'll talk about the specific functions of these steroid hormones towards the end of the lecture. So now we know how to transport steroid hormones, what the mechanism of action of the steroid hormones is. Now let's talk about the synthesis of these steroid hormones. Again, the majority of these steroid hormones are produced within the adrenal cortex of the adrenal glands. And the precursor molecules to all of these steroid hormones is the same. It's a 27 carbon precursor we call cholesterol. So cholesterol can either be obtained from our diet or we can synthesize cholesterol from scratch within our liver. But whatever the origin of cholesterol is, this is what it looks like. So we have this hydrocarbon chain on one end, we have a hydroxyl group on the other end, and in between we have these four rings, one, two, three, four, and then we have a double bond here. Now, what happens is in a multi-step process, we essentially reduce the hydrocarbon chain and we can hydroxylate the rings and ultimately cholesterol can be transformed into either aldosterone or cortisol or a variety of different types of sex hormones. Now, the first step is the rate limiting step. The first step is catalyzed by an enzyme known as desmolase. Desmolase is a cytochrome P450 mixed function oxidase enzyme that is located on the inner mitochondrial membrane. And it utilizes the reducing power of NADPH and oxygen, diatomic oxygen, to remove six carbons from this, uh, from this hydrocarbon chain add an oxygen atom here and remove this bond here. 
And so we form, we convert a 27 cholesterol molecule to a, 20, a, a, to a 21 carbon atom molecule known as pregnenolone. And pregnenolone can then basically go on via these three pathways. Now, the pathway that occurs here depends on where we are within our cortex, within our adrenal cortex. So here is the adrenal cortex, and we can actually divide it into three different regions. We have the outer region, we have the middle region, and the inner region. So this is the outer region, this is the middle region, and this is the inner region uh, of the cortex. Cortex of the adrenal glands. Now the outer region is also known as zona glomerulosa. The middle region is also known as zona fasciculata. And the inner region is also known as zona reticularis. So GFR, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. Now in zona fasciculata, this is the pathway that will occur. We will form cortisol. In zona glomerulosa, this is the pathway that will occur. We're going to form aldosterone. And in zona reticularis, this is the pathway that will predominate. So this is the zona glomerulosa, this is the zona fasciculata, and this is the zona reticularis. So let's talk about these pathways individually. So first of all, pregna uh, first of all pregnolone is converted in, uh, into progesterone by the activity of an enzyme known as 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Now all of these enzymes shown in red are mixed function oxidases, just like desmolase is. Once we form progesterone, let's follow this pathway here. So under stressful situations, for example, because of an underlying infection, the brain will activate the hypothalamus to produce a molecule known as CRH, known as corticotropin-releasing hormone. So under conditions of stress, i.e. infection, the hypothalamus releases CRH. That travels via the bloodstream into a nearby anterior pituitary gland in which the CRH stimulates the production and release of ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH is a peptide hormone. It simply diffuses in the blood and it travels to the zona, uh, zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex. It binds onto receptors on that cell membrane within these cells, and it increases cyclic AMP production. And ultimately what that does is it stimulates the production and release of cortisol, the stress hormone. And cortisol does a bunch of things. Again, cortisol is picked up in the bloodstream by corticosteroid binding globulin, and then it moves to many different types of cells. We transport it into adipose cells, we transport it into liver cells, we transport it to fibroblasts, and so forth. So cortisol does a bunch of things. So for one thing, cortisol increases lipolysis. So cortisol ends up in the adipose tissue and that increases lipolysis within adipose tissue. So that basically redistributes fat in our body and that can cause central obesity in patients. Um, it also increases proteolysis. So it moves the skeletal muscle tissue and increases breakdown of protein. It also goes to the liver and increases gluconeogenesis. So ultimately, we're producing more glucose. Why? Well, because we have high levels of stress and we want more glucose to basically deal with that stress. For example, we want to deal with that infection. In addition, cortisol increases the blood pressure. How? Well, cortisol increases the expression of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors on arterioles, and that makes those arterioles more sensitive to epinephrine and norepinephrine, and that can increase the blood pressure. In addition, cortisol can also actually bind onto aldosterone receptors and increase the amount of reabsorption of water by the kidneys. Cortisol also decreases our immune activity and, and decreases the inflammatory process. So it does a bunch of things. It decreases the ability of neutrophils to actually bind onto uh, endothelium. And so that can increase neutrophils in the bloodstream and cause neutrophilia. 
it can also decrease the production of other white blood cells. And if you remember, cortisol also actually decreases the activity of phospholipase A2, and that decreases production of leukotrienes and it decreases the production of prostaglandins. Cortisol also decreases the ability of osteoblasts to form bone, and so that decreases bone formation, and that can cause osteoporosis in the long term. It also decreases activity of fibroblasts in the skin, and that can cause development of these striations on the skin. And it increases insulin resistance. So cortisol basically does a bunch of things as a result of a higher level of stress. Now let's talk about the synthesis of cortisol. So progesterone is converted into 17-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone by the activity of 17-alpha-hydroxylase. Then this is converted by the activity of 21-alpha-hydroxylase to 11-deoxycortisol. And finally, 11-deoxycortisol is converted to cortisol by the activity of 11-beta-hydroxylase. So all of this happens within the zona fasciculata, in the middle portion of the cortex. Then let's move on to the outer portion, the zona glomerulosa. So let's suppose in our body we have low levels of sodium, and so low levels of sodium end up in the kidneys. So this will stimulate the juxtaglomerular apparatus in the kidneys to release renin. Renin then goes on and activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, system. So renin causes more production of angiotensin 2, and angiotensin 2 actually stimulates release and production of aldosterone. So in the zona glomerulosa, we transform progesterone into 11-deoxycortisone via the activity of 21-alpha-hydroxylase. This then is converted into uh, a corticosterone, uh, corticosterone by the activity of 11-beta-hydroxylase. And then we have aldosterone synthase converts it into aldosterone. And angiotensin II acts on aldosterone synthase to increase its activity to produce more aldosterone. And so aldosterone will act on the distal nephron to increase the reabsorption of sodium and that will allow us to reabsorb more water and that can increase the blood pressure. And it also causes secretion of potassium. So that can actually cause hypokalemia, so level, uh, low levels of potassium. So again, when there is a low level of sodium reaching the kidneys, the juxtaglomerular apparatus of the kidneys releases renin. This ultimately forms more angiotensin II, which stimulates the zona glomerulosa to release more aldosterone by increasing the activity of aldosterone synthase. Aldosterone acts on the distal nephron to increase sodium reabsorption while decreasing the potas uh, uh, while increasing potassium secretion. Now, I want to come back for a second to ACTH here. In the same way that angiotensin II increases aldosterone synthase activity, ACTH released by the anterior pituitary gland increases production of desmolase, or increases the activity of desmolase, and that ultimately helps form more cortisol. And then we have the zona reticularis. So both the zona fasciculata actually and the zona reticularis can actually produce androgens, but predominantly androgens are produced in the zona, fascicula, uh, zona reticularis. So the two major ones are DHEA, which is not shown in this pathway here, and androstenedione. So androstenedione is converted from 17-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone. Uh, Once we form androstenedione, it can either be transformed into testosterone within the adrenal cortex, or this can move into the bloodstream, move into peripheral tissues, and be transformed into testosterone. Testosterone can either carry out its function, or we can transform into estradiol or into another molecule called DH8, uh, DHT. So we'll come back to this later on. So, once we form these steroid hormones, and once they carry out their function, how do we break them down? Well, the breakdown of metabolism of steroid hormones occurs within the liver. So the liver is able to modify these steroid hormones. For example, we can add sulfate, uh, sul uh, sulfate groups, we can add glucuronic acid, and all of this makes the 
molecule more water soluble and it inactivates it. About 20 to 30 percent of these metabolized steroid hormones are excreted via the biliary tree into the feces and the remainder 70 to 80 percent are excreted via the kidneys in the urine so essentially end up being excreted in the urine. 